Uh, well, let's talk about this with Sir Ian Duncan Smith. He's former leader of the Conservative Party, still, of course, on the, uh, Lib the uh, Tory benches. Good morning to you, Sir Ian. Uh, good morning, Julie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, what's interesting, Suella Braverman making these comments, I mean, she said pretty much nothing different to what Angela Merkel said when she was German Chancellor, Emmanuel Macron as President of France, the Swedish Prime Minister this year, the Italian Prime Minister this year, even the New York a black democratic, uh, a democratic mayor uh, making a number of these comments. But she, uh, her words, are poisonous. Why has she been attacked so much for this speech? Well, I think a lot of it's to do with the, uh, the the idea of the we're in a run to the election as well now. So anything that anybody says that looks like it might get some purchase is immediately attacked by the other side. There's always this uh, knee-jerk reaction to any attempt to open up the debate about how we manage and deal with migration. I mean, migration is a fact of life. It's been hiring for centuries. But the key thing is how do you uh, manage it and how do you manage it in a way that allows people to assimilate properly and you know one of the areas that rose uh, with uh, with uncontrolled migration was modern day slavery where a lot of uh, people have been trafficked into countries like the UK um, mm. and uh, are literally whether it's in brothels or in chain gangs or forced labor these are sometimes the downside products of just deciding that it doesn't really matter because that immediately opens the door to criminality and the final thing is the way that people come in uh, as a result of that, uh, becomes very dangerous to them. You've seen the boats in the channel. You only have to go across and look at the Mediterranean to see the disaster that's taking place. People trying to get to Lampedusa, uh, outnumbering now the local population. So you, you're right. She is not the only one to be saying this. And, of course, because the, the media here want to have a go at her, she's become a hate figure for anybody who uh, b believes on the liberal left, that she can't actually raise a subject yeah. which is quite necessary to debate and discuss uh, the, uh, this uh, position, this uh, presence at UN, is it's sort of out of date and does need looking at very carefully because there's an awful lot that is now happening, which doesn't mean controlled migration works. No, indeed. I mean, yesterday when we had looked at the advance of the speech, we were talking about you know what she wanted to do with the you know, the refugee convention um, and, uh, and and talking in more detail on some of the policy aspects. But this was not the speech that wasn't given out in advance. It was about you know the the impacts of these decisions. Um, but one of the key things she said is that multiculturalism has failed, and I was fascinated by the response from the left. I mean, across the board, the usual suspects uh, all had pretty. Much much the same thing to say. It was absolutely astonishing. John Sopel, classic example. Let me read you his tweet yesterday. Um, Multiculturalism has failed, says Suella Braverman, who is from Kenyan and Mauritian background and married to a Jew, serving as Home Secretary in a government led by someone whose family came from India. Wonder what multicultural success looks like. Now, I, I, I read this as just yet another example, the, la the la sort of Labour left sort of viewpoint, where everybody is nothing more than the colour of their skin and their, their ethnicity, their family background is all that they are because we have to divide people up into those these things. I look at Swella Bravman and I think she's British because she is born in this country, she is British. Her parents came to this country. She, it would appear, like um, Rishi Sunak, comes from a family where immigrant families who've made their home in Britain, they wanted to come here to integrate, to assimilate, to give their children, their families the best chance of life, um, speaking the language, assimilating to the culture, you know, absolutely, you know, uh, taking advantage of every opportunity that our culture provides uh, for advancement, which is why we've got this wonderfully multi-ethnic, uh, not multicultural, multi-ethnic government, um, which tells you how much people can succeed here. A lot of people on the Labour and the left side, they they misunderstand what multiculturalism is. They just think, see it as, as skin colour, don't they? And multicultural has got nothing to do with multiracial. Exactly, that's the point. The problem is that um, multiculturalism is about you being of a specific nationality when you come over, that you remain in that category, that, uh, but defined perhaps by the colour of your skin or by the very fact that you're from somewhere else, that no, there must be no attempt uh, uh, or uh, pressure for you to assimilate. Now, what that leads to is what she was getting at, is that you then have a lack of cohesion and then that starts to fester in the antipathy of one group to another. And that's where you end up. And that's where we have in some of our streets ended up now. You know, street gangs mm -hmm. defined uh, by their original ethnic culture who are not assimilated now but are dangerously fighting each other. These are the problems. And, of course, it's very good for those on the left to sneer 
about this. But of course, they don't pick up the pieces because so many of them are living in communities where they're able to pick and choose yeah. who their friends and who their neighbours are to some degree. The problem is, almost certainly most fa uh, felt, is down in communities where there is less income, where people are poorer, they have very little choice, and that's where you get the danger and the problems yeah. from. So it's not a say, it's, it is not the same uh, as being, uh, uh, you know, anti any race. Quite the contrary. It's when you look at, you said earlier on, you look at this government. I mean, I was thinking of Nadim Zahawi, mm. who came over from his family, fled Iraq. They've assimilated in the UK. He's proud of his roots, uh, but he's been successful over here. You look at Suella herself, or even the Prime Minister today, and what you end up seeing, therefore, is you still are proud of your roots. You still hold on to those things that define your past and your family and to a degree your presence, but you've assimilated and you've taken the benefits of what happens in the UK. Uh, I know of no other country on earth, <clears throat> uh, or certainly of the free world, that is so quick to be able to allow people to both assimilate and to go to the highest office or to become the greatest. Well, I mean, you, in America, other than that, you can't be prime minister, you can't be, sorry, you can't be president of America unless you're it. born in America. But, again, but this is the thing. I think there's always this confusion between, oh, well, we live in a multicultural society and we live in a multiracial society. I couldn't give, give two hoots what colour anyone's skin is. Totally irrelevant. I don't care about people's religions as long as it doesn't impact in terms of, like, you know, if your religion says that, you know, we, we should behead a, a, a grammar school teacher who shows a, a, a cart into pupils, then I've got an issue with it. But that is a particularly extremist uh, version of one particular religion. But when we are talking at a situation where um, so many on the left would basically say, you know, we should be multicultural, that is a great success. When we clearly are, when you've got in many, many of our great cities, you have completely different cultural divides. You know, you have an Asian community from one part of one country, another Asian community from another country. Uh, you've got, you know, black community, white community, a Polish community, another. And they're living, they're not living side by side. The city may be overall that, but actually they're living in different enclaves, not mixing, um, not not children don't go to school together they're not marrying into each other's families they're not sharing their culture they're living separately that that is not healthy that is not good and and we know uh, and people for, for, for decades have been talking about how you can only assimilate a sort of a certain percentage of the populate a new population in to your country in a short time and we are seeing waves of millions of people in the, coming to this country who are setting up sort of parallel sort of uh, societies where they're not integrating and not part of mainstream society, and that is clearly an issue. And we know that. Dame Louise Casey, a report commissioned, um, published in 2016, commissioned by David Cameron, published under Theresa May, where you know, looked at, you know, we've got whole, you know, we've got cities like, like Leicester, like Bradford, where we've got complete and utter isolated uh, parts of society. That is not multiculturalism. That is not going to lead to a successful, happy, cohesive community. Yes, I, I think that what happens is that people want to go to the extremes of this. So the extreme is to say that uh, uh, that they can do what they like and it doesn't matter. Uh, and in fact, what this is, is not saying uh, they will never uh, reflect their culture, they will, people will never be able to practice their religion, mm. or they'll never celebrate. I mean, you have waves of people that came over from Russia during the pogroms there in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, uh, they, you know, Jewish people assimilated, they're still proud of their roots. Uh, they still practice their religion and they still get together and celebrate things that happen mm. in their history and carry on in many cases sometimes talking to each other in, in their own language but always assimilating in the sense uh, that they are part of the UK, they're UK citizens and they have a shared uh, a shared presence and a shared history. So the, the, the point that she's making has been made as you said earlier on by endless European politicians. Yeah. Europe at the moment has a significant problem. We see one bit of it here, but if you live in Italy, and I have uh, uh, two sisters who live in Italy and live there most of their lives, uh, there is a real problem there because what you're getting is significant numbers of people coming in and then moving away from Italy, moving through, creating change, massive change in certain areas mm. where uh, you know people whose main culture uh, reflects I Italian history and the nature of how they live is actually getting moved by very sudden and very quick change 
uh, which makes it very difficult. And, it, the, yeah. and it's not it's not racist or xenophobic or bigoted to say, um, hello, we never voted for this, we didn't agree to this, because people haven't. And, and it is extraordinary that anybody who does speak about this, even a woman of colour, um, <laughs> is, is basically accused of being a racist. That's what they're saying at this time. Can I ask you about a couple of other big stories in the news? Um, Labour have said that they will uh, put VAT at 20% on school fees, uh, on school, school's income, sorry, um, uh, in private school's income if they get to power next year. Private schools have basically said, you know, you're going to war with us, we'll go to war with you. Um, where do you stand on this? I just think this is the politics of envy all over again. This Labour Party is disguising the nature of what it's going to do. It wants to attack private schools, not for any other reason except ideology. Uh, they have this obsession that somehow British education would be better if we didn't have private schools, what we used to always call public schools. Schools that have, have, have hugely been part of the history of the UK raising standards. And yet again, it's a classic levelling down approach, which is somehow, I don't like you because I dislike the idea that you can use your money to take school. So what I can do is get rid of you already, certainly make life very difficult for you. Somehow elsewhere, we're going to raise standards by doing that. You're not going to raise standards by doing that. You'll suddenly have a lot of schools closing down. You know, the idea that every single uh, public or private school is an Eton is complete yeah. rubbish. Most of them live hand to mouth. They, 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 they uh, are chosen by families who have very uh, ordinary income, who make sacrifices because they want extra bits and pieces in their education, maybe more sport. Sometimes, uh, you know, a school has a, a very good record in, in science or whatever, and they want their child to go to that, and they can't get the school of their choice as they think stands yeah. at the moment. And that's the key. People are making a choice. If you try and put VAT on, many of these sort of schools will close. And these kids will then be looking for schools and places which are non-existent in many communities. Yeah, but that's you know, apparently that's supposed to bring up standards elsewhere, but again, question box about that. Can I just ask you, just find on the schools issue, report that's going to the uh, COVID inquiry today about lockdown and children, basically saying that uh, the impact on children, the harm has been long-lasting and era-defining and was preventable. Your brief word on that. Well, I voted against, uh, and I wouldn't vote for, I voted against the lockdowns because I could see straight away that what we were doing, we were going to so destabilise society and the way that we live and our economy that it would have severe repercussions later on. Who knew, that? I, I set up the Centre for Social Justice and they did a report on this uh, some months ago uh, and from them it's the term ghost children that have, has appeared. Children that have never come back to school. Attitudes towards education have collapsed in some communities. Parents who don't take their children to school. These kids will end up without any qualifications in dangerous activities, quite often drifting in basically street gangs, drug dealing, all that sort of stuff, because uh, education was the pathway out. We know that work is the way out of poverty, but education is the route to be able to get decent yeah. jobs, and that has collapsed. And I'm afraid this experiment that was driven by too many scientists who said in an absolute we must lock down, whereas in Sweden they didn't, uh, and they showed that people can be trusted. Yeah. That... And children under 16 didn't miss a day of school in Sweden, and they've got a uh... lower excess death rate than we have. There you are. Sir Doug Smith, we'll leave it there. Great to talk to you on all those different topics. Thank you. Always good to get your thoughts.